If you ask people how they came to the Dharma, you get all kinds of answers. Some people come from having suffered loss. Some people because they're stressed out. Everyone's looking for some peace of mind. If you had asked the Buddha how he came to the Dharma, he would have said it because he realized he was subject to aging, illness, and death. And he wanted to find something that didn't age, didn't grow ill, didn't die. So we owe the Dharma, on the one hand, to the fact that there is aging, illness, and death, and two, the desire to get away from those things. That's a very ambitious desire. But the Buddha found that by following it, he was able to succeed. So that's the Dharma we have. His quest is reflected in that reflection that we chanted just now. I'm subject to aging, subject to illness, subject to death, subject to separation. Those are the feelings of Sung Wega that the young prince felt in contemplating aging, illness, and death. Then there was Basada, confidence. There's a way out. It's through your actions. I'm the owner of my actions. His quest, as he said, was to find what was skillful. So he focused immediately on his actions. He wasn't interested in testing the idea that human action was incapable of finding the deathless or that the deathless could be found without acting. He wanted to see, is there a path of action that would lead to the deathless? It had to be a path going someplace. It couldn't be a cause for the deathless, because after all, if the deathless was caused, then when the cause has changed, the deathless would be gone. So we went in search of a path, in search of what it was skillful. He had a lot of false starts, but he finally found the way. And that's reflected in that other passage which chanted just now, the teaching he gave to Ratabala, the one that Ratabala said was his inspiration for leaving home. It's how he came to the Dharma. The world is swept away, it does not endure. He explains this to a king, and the way he explains it is that it's about aging. The king wants to know what it means. And Ratabella asked him, when you were young, were you strong? And the king says, yes. Well, how about now? Well, no, no, I'm 80 years old. I mean, to put my foot one place and it goes someplace else. That's the problem with aging. It's a lack of control. We're beginning to lose control. And the other drama summary. The world is without shelter. There's no one in charge. He illustrates that with illness. Does the king have an illness? Yes. Recurring wind disease, which basically is sh shooting pains throughout the body. And John Fuang had a wind disease. Apparently it was associated with his heart. And it could be fatal. As the king says, sometimes I'm lying there in bed in pain, and my courtiers are standing around saying, maybe he'll die now, maybe he'll die now. The Ratabella says, can you ask them to share out the pain so you don't have to feel so much of it yourself? The king says, no, I've got to share it. My, I've got to feel it myself. No shelter. You can't be in charge of your pain. Again, loss of control. The world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. And that's about death. The king asks, what do you mean the world has nothing of its own? I've got plenty of treasures stored away. Ratapala asked him, can you take them with you when you die? Well, no, of course. Can't. 
And just as the first contemplation doesn't leave you hanging there with just aging, illness, and death. The fourth Dharma summary points to where the solution is. Craving. We're slaves to craving. Even though the world is insufficient, we keep coming back. In this case, he illustrates it with a question of the king. Suppose someone were to come from the east and say there's a kingdom to the east. Plenty of wealth, but very weak. You could, With your force of arms, you could conquer it. Would you go for it? Here he is, 80 years old. He says, yes, of course. How about someone coming from the west, the north, the south? Yes, 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 in each case. How about someone from across the ocean? Yes. In other words, the mind is insatiable. That's where the problem is. You look at those first three Dharma, Dharma summaries, and they reflect the three perceptions that the Buddha has you adopt as part of the path. Aging, inconstancy, illness, stress, death, not self, you know, the ultimate loss of control. But again, he doesn't leave you there. They're there in service of that quest to find a way of bringing out dispassion for craving. We suffer from these things because of our craving, and only when we deal with our craving are we going to get anywhere. So that's the focus of the teachings. That's the kernel of the Four Noble Truths. You solve the problem of suffering not by solving suffering, you solve the cause. You've got to abandon the cause. We want to abandon the suffering, we want to push it away. But it doesn't work. You've got to find the cause. It's like going into your house and seeing that it's flooded with water. If you just bail out the water without checking to see where the water comes from, it can just keep coming and coming and coming. In this case, it's probably a burst pipe. You've got to wade through the water to find the pipe. Now, there's going to be some suffering on the path. There's going to be a lot you don't like, but it gets you to where the solution is, and that's what matters. You find the craving, and you begin to look at it. As the Buddha said, you look at its origination, you look at its cessation, you look at its allure, you look at its drawbacks. So you finally can get some dispassion for it. Because otherwise, the craving would keep going. As he gave an analysis one other time, someone asked him, how is it that a being goes from one body to another at death? And the Buddha said, it's like a flame going from one house to another. The flame has some sustenance. It has a support. It clings to the wind. In the same way, we cling to craving. So when we think about death, that's what we've got to think about. It's not just a question of what's it going to be like when everything ends. Things don't end. Some things end, but craving can keep going on. And it will go on unless you tame it. And here it is. It's something that's so intimate and something we take as our friend. As Buddha said, everywhere we go, we go with craving as our companion. We've trusted it all along. In the form of desire, he said, it's the root of all our experiences. So as you meditate, think about why you're here. Maybe the reason you came to the meditation may be one thing, but you have to realize if you want to get the most out of it, it has an awful lot to offer, but it's going to challenge you. This friend that you've been hanging around with so long, turns out it's, it's a murderous friend. The Buddha talks about people trusting their aggregates, the aggregates they cling to, and it turns out the image he gives is of someone who's planning to kill you, and they work their way into your confidence. And then when they find you in a likely place, they stab you. Well, the same applies to your craving. So 
So what do you do? We can't just say, drop craving, be done with it. You focus your craving on the path, the qualities of mind you need to develop. In order to look at the craving, look at your more unskillful forms of craving, you realize you've got something better as you've got the path that you've been working on. That's why this is a search for what is skillful. The skills you can develop as you meditate and as you practice all the aspects of the training. They're there to provide you with a good, solid place to stay, or a relatively solid place to stay. So you can begin to call some of your cravings into question, get the mind in a good state of concentration, where there's rapture and bliss that come from simply sitting here being very still, secluded from sensuality. That's the first type of craving you've got to watch out for, because that's so pervasive. If you can pull the mind out of its fascination with thinking about sensual desires, sensual objects, focus its passion here and just on being inside the body, inhabiting it, it puts you in a good place to look back. You get a perspective that you wouldn't have otherwise. That this is what happiness is like. We get it all mixed up. We get a little thrill out of indulging in our sensual pleasures, and we think that's happiness. But as you try to maintain it, hold on to it, it just slips away. It's just a little bit outside your grasp, just a little bit beyond what you can hold on to. But if you can settle in here, you realize there's a strong sense of well-being. As the Buddha said, there is no happiness other than peace. This is where the real happiness lies. And this isn't even the ultimate, but it's, a for, it's your first taste of what it's like to put down some of your craving and the peace that can come. And you're better positioned to look at what was the allure of all that sensual thinking anyhow. What did you think you were gaining from it? In terms of your self-image, in terms of your idea of holding on to something, it's there to deny everything you think about it. So work on this concentration. It's the first step to developing the dispassion. You need to get past that craving that otherwise will just keep pulling you on, pulling you on, pulling you on, having to come back to more aging, illness, and death. The Buddha is asking you to set your sights high, aim high. Don't be satisfied with just some stress reduction or a little bit of peace of mind. There's a lot more you can accomplish. Try to get the most of what the Dharma has to offer.